A while back, I was having a very tough day, and a little thing happened to change that. Amit Kapoor emailed me with a link to their latest episode of Famous and Gravy, the podcast he co-hosts with producer Michael Osborne. As you'll hear, this podcast starts like a game show, and I'd been a contestant. Take a listen. Her 1970s TV show was a balm to widespread anxieties about women in the workforce. Her character faced such issues as equal pay, birth control, and sexual independence. I mean, 1970s, I'm thinking like Mary Tyler Moore and Rhoda. Not Mary Tyler Moore, is it? Dance. Mary Tyler Moore. Today's dead celebrity is Mary Tyler Moore. That's right. The show I'm deconstructing today is about dead celebrities. Famous and Gravy is hilarious and philosophical, funny and thought-provoking. It's about life's biggest questions. That day, I listened to all the things I didn't know about Mary Tyler Moore's life and to Michael and Amit reflecting on it, which led them to reflect on their own lives, which led me to reflect on mine, which is actually the point of Famous and Gravy, along with entertaining the heck out of us. This Sound Judgment episode is the last one of the season before we take a hiatus to plan our next one, which will be bigger and better than ever. So it feels appropriate to end with a show that that day lifted my mood like a hot air balloon, partly because what we all need sometimes is a good laugh. So here's an episode to take you into summer. You'll learn a lot about creative constraints and how crafting an extremely structured show can make audio storytelling easier, more efficient, and more creative. You'll learn a fresh approach to co-hosting, and you'll learn how to hook your listener in the first 30 seconds, and equally important, how to end episodes in a way that keeps your listeners coming back. This is Sound Judgment, where we investigate just what it takes to become a beloved podcast host by pulling apart one episode at a time together. I'm Elaine Appleton Grant. Storytellers, did you know that Sound Judgment is also a free newsletter? Every two weeks, get storytelling, hosting, and journalism strategies taken straight from the on the ground experiences of today's best audio makers, no matter the genre. Newsletters feature examples for you to try in your studio, essays on the challenges and rewards of this craft, and news about fellow audio creatives making the kind of work we all aspire to. Sign up free at podcastallies.com. Welcome, Michael Osborne and Amit Kapoor. I am so excited to have you here. Excited to be here. Thank you for inviting us on, Elaine. Very excited, Elaine. Thank you. So... You have now produced more than 50 episodes. What has been your biggest creative challenge so far? Yeah, we deal with a, a seemingly serious subject, which is somebody that has passed away recently. Uh, but really, our North Star and why people keep tuning in is the fun and the intrigue. Mm. We talk about trauma. We talk about grief, but to always return and make it fun and entertaining is is not an easy thing to marry. And I think it took us a while and we're continuing to evolve into that groove to find that that sort of perfect mix between informative, respectful, but above all fun and entertaining. It's a hard show to describe in some ways. Like one question that's come up for us a few times is how do you categorize the show? And there was a time earlier in our history where I was like, I think this should go into self-help. Uh, and that got laughed down really quickly. This is not a self-help show. It's now categorized in TV and entertainment, which I think is right. It's self-help for me, though, and I think it's self-help for Ahmet, and I hope it's a kind of um, subversive form of self-help for the listener that, you know, it, this is meant to be a kind of brainstorm on what do you wish you were doing with your life and what are virtues that you admire or dreams that you aspire to achieve? So th there's there's all these sort of deeper philosophical underpinnings on what is ultimately, uh, as you said, Amit, a fun show and a kind of lighthearted show. And, and I can think of points in the episode that we are about to dissect where I did take I don't know if you'd call it self-help, but a reframing of a couple of things from that. So 
Michael and Amit, you score a dead celebrity on 12 different categories. But to start, you quiz unsuspecting listeners about how much they actually know about famous people. So let's listen to a bit of your test from the episode that we're about to pull apart. This is Famous and Gravy, a conversation about quality of life as we see it, one dead celebrity at a time. Now for the opening quiz to reveal today's dead celebrity. This person died 2014, age 86. She was a Tony-nominated stage actress. After her first marriage, she embarked on a career as a calypso dancer. Good grief. <laughs> no idea. All right, keep going. She was a college professor and a ubiquitous presence on the lecture circuit. She also made several appearances on Sesame Street. Oh, man, uh, Tony Morrison? Not Tony Morrison. In 2011, she was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Now that I should know, although I was busy, I was busy in 2011. I missed it. <laughs> the whole year? <laughs> I, I missed busy. the entire year. What an excuse. <laughs> Throughout her writing, she explored the concepts of personal identity and resilience through the multifaceted lens of race, sex, family, community, and the collective past. It's not Maya Angelou. Maya Angelou? Not Maya Angelou, is it? Maya Angelou. Today's dead celebrity is Maya Angelou. I didn't even say it right. Maya Angelou. Okay, so we Angelou. know that we have about 30 seconds to hook a listener, a new listener to a show. So this particular gimmick that you guys came up with says something to the listener about pacing and the emotional purpose of the show, the work it's doing for the listener. Am I right about that? Yeah, I think I, I think 100%. It's tone setting. It's like when an athlete has walk-up music. You know, baseball players choose a song to walk up, and that's what this is doing, is saying, yes, this is a show that is dealing with people that have recently died, but this is, above all, going to be a, a fun and pleasurable experience. We don't obviously have time to dip into each of the 12 criteria that you use to uh, sort of grade the, the life of a person. Can you sum up what those 12 categories are intended to score in a word? Is that possible? Absolutely, because I think they, they fall into subcategories. The first few categories are really designed to lay the groundwork to tell a story, that we're going to be telling the story of somebody's life. Um and maybe begin the process of picking out unique characteristics, qualities that we want to draw attention to. There's another set of categories that are really about statistics, in a sense, data. Um, you know, what is known about this person? And then I think that the second half of the show is in many ways where we go a level deeper in terms of empathetic imagining, where we really try and get into the shoes. What would it have been like to have been this person? All of that sets the ground for the driving question of every episode, which is a, a very simple binary, do you want this life, yes or no? Um, so all of it's sort of meant to build an argument both for and against along the way. It is a very, very intricate structure. Totally. And and I've it, that's new for me. I've never developed a podcast that is so built on category segments and structure this way. Uh, and I've got to say, I've come to love it because it, the once you sort of get it in a place where you like the structure, it just does so much work for you that by the time Ahmed and I sit down to record, I just have high confidence that we're going to get good tape every time. Um, so it was really Amit who had an insight around categories. I wanted to ask Michael and Amit about the 12 categories that they use in every episode to examine a celebrity's life. We started by touching on category number one. They grade the first line of the person's obituary. Storytellers, I've talked in other episodes about hooking your listener in the first 30 seconds. But another focus is the strategy that you employ for showing listeners why they should stick around. How do you persuade them it will be worth their time to listen to the rest of the episode? Take a listen to this clip. Category one, grading the first line of their obituary. Maya Angelou, whose landmark book of 1969, I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings, a lyrical, unsparing account of her childhood in the Jim Crow South 
was among the first autobiographies by a 20th century black woman to reach a wide general readership, died on Wednesday at her home in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. She was 86. I guess they just had to pick one thing. That is like the challenge of this first line. I mean, they get into all the other stuff in the rest of the article, but in terms of the first line, you got to pick one thing, right? The thing is there's like 30 mega things. Right. And this Grading the first line of the obit sets the stage for what we're about to dive into. There's that intrigue that Michael and Amit mentioned. In that first attempt to grade the obit, we hear the two hosts' different interpretations of the same question. It's interesting, it's fun, and they're creating an expectation for their listeners about their own relationship. But let's listen to Michael's reasoning for why they do this. The other thing that it really does for me, though, and I think, Amit, you'd agree with this, is that it begins to differentiate the sort of what is known about this person versus how we feel about this person. We take the first line from the New York Times, and and we're calling that a sort of standard of objectivity. Here's what you know this person for, and here's the language we're going to use to remember them. And then when we start picking that apart... What do you like about these words? How do you feel about it? Is it accurate? Is it eloquent? Is it uh, lofty? Does it have these desirable qualities that sets the scene for the conversation that follows after? It also just gives a great overview of the story, you know, before we've even talked anymore. So it just does a lot of work for us. I like that focus on what can do a lot of work in a short period of time. And I think that makes sense. And of course, from a feature writing standpoint, and I always look at things that way because I was in magazines for about 15 years before I went into audio, is that, you know, you are looking at the first line and what kind of work does that first line do for people? And does it grab you? It's sort of like the first 30 seconds. It's all about hooking you. And then the rest of it is about keeping you there. And which is very much what sound judgment mm-hmm. really is about, is how do we how do we keep people there? And so you guys have already identified a few really interesting things. You know, this very structured approach, the the buddy podcast, which yeah. we'll get to, and then you know this cross between very serious stuff and entertainment and fun. You're doing a lot of work with these episodes, which I admire, but it's fun. What do you think? The more work the producer, the host does for you as a listener, the more fun and easy it is to listen to? Absolutely. Yeah, 100%. No question about it. Creativity emerges from constraint. So what we've done with our show is hardwire all these rules for what's going to happen episode to episode. And counterintuitively, that allows us a tremendous amount of room for spontaneity and innovation and tangents and unexpected directions. I guess one of the lessons for me about Famous and Gravy is that the more you narrow the directions and and give yourself clear instructions, um, the more you can optimize to bring those great conversations out. Could not agree more with the necessity for creative guardrails. So as I said, I'm not going to go through all 12 criteria, but we are going to do number two next because I just mentioned being a feature writer. It functions sort of like a nut graph for a feature writer. So the lead hooks you and then in the nut graph, you're going to tell us listeners why we care about this topic, this person right now, why it's relevant to us. And that seems to me to be the function of number two, which is five things I love about you. So let's listen to just the first of the five things with Maya. Category two, five things I love about you. Here, Amit and I work together to come up with five reasons why we love this person, why we ought to be talking about them in the first place. Why don't you do it, man? You take it. So number one, I'm going to go Marvel superhero. So this has to do with her origin story, which is largely sad and and very tragic. And I wasn't fully aware of the story until getting into this episode. At the age of seven, she had been raped by her mother's boyfriend. And she had told only one person about it, which was her brother. She was afraid to tell other people. And it eventually 
her, her brother told other members of the family, and it got to her uncles. And the next day, the police show up at her house. They were reporting that this person who had spent one night in jail for the rape of a seven-year-old Maya Angelou had been killed, had been kicked to death. Her response, as she says, in my seven-year-old mind, was that my voice can kill. And her response to that was she goes mute, meaning she actually does not speak a word for five years because she is afraid that if she opens her mouth, people will die. This becomes her educational, period. There are tons of stories about celebrities. After all, that's practically the definition of being a celebrity. So how are you choosing what's most relevant? Tell me about about the behind the scenes, how you came up with this. Uh, It's a story I never knew. And it really moved me, I think, because of the fact that as as that clip goes on, I say what emerged from that is one of the greatest orators of our time. And what I guess I found so impressive is it could have been the end of the story right there. You could have lived out a a very sad and traumatic life. And the turnaround, her ability to leverage that as a power and later influence the entire world with her voice was just so moving to me and, frankly, inspirational. I'm curious, Amit, in what way was it inspirational to you personally? Uh, I mean, I I have had some deep, dark troubles uh, in my past, and, you know, some of them I'm still navigating through. Uh, to, To hear this example of what emerged is the exact opposite of what your trauma is, uh, and by no means am I comparing my my trauma to what my Angelo experienced as a seven year old, but it's really nice to see it play out in a way that really does change other lives. So right now I'm editing an episode, which by the time this one comes out, it will have been released with Sam Mullins, who is the host and producer of Wild Boys. And he is an actor and a writer, but had never done a podcast. And he gets hooked up with Karen Duffin, an editor who he winds up, you know, just revering. And I said, what did you learn about writing? You know, he'd been writing for 15, 16 years at that point. And one of the things that he said is, that at every point along the way, they were looking not just at plot. This is a limited series narrative mystery. But at every beat along the way, how do we want the listener to feel? It sounds to me that when you're working on these episodes, that you are thinking about that very question. So with this particular choice of a superpower, Amit, Obviously, it moved you. Were you thinking at all about how do I want the listener to feel? Completely. I thought I want the listener to to feel empowered by any setback, big or small, to know that there is a resolution and there could even be uh, an unimaginable out- outcome that is positive. What I want to do now is shift to talking about how you two work together as co-hosts. And I'm very informed on this question by a couple of episodes that I have done with other co-hosts. I had um, Sarah Stewart Holland and Beth Silvers on. They're the co-hosts of Pantsuit Politics, which is a show I, I love, and they're delightful. And I had observed, and they completely agreed with this, that actually what they said was the reason the show works is because they are very different. They work together really well, but they're very different in many ways. And I just want to play something for you. Category nine. 
outgoing message. Like Man in the Mirror, how do we think they felt about the sound of their own voice when they heard it on an answering machine or outgoing voicemail? Also, where they have had the humility to use it when they, and record their themselves on their outgoing message, or would they use the default setting? I wrote, are you kidding me? Yes and yes. Do you take issue with that? I do. Fuck me. All time. Are you just one being of the contrary? All, no, really? No. Okay. All one right, of the all time greatest voices. Let's not forget. She said at the age of seven, my words can kill. Yeah. She also said that mutism is an addiction. You know, it is her defense mechanism. Even after Martin Luther King Jr. died on her birthday, she went mute again for five days. She does yeah, until harbor. James Baldwin came and knocked on her door and said, "You need to come meet my writer friends." And then out of that comes Cage Bird. Yeah, and then she became yeah. one of the great orators of our time in the ways she delivered poems, the way she delivered speeches. But I'm not sure that she sits there and listens to her own recordings. I think she loves to dole it out, and she loves that other people can receive it. She talks about so much that words are things. But I think she has an issue with hearing her own, as evidenced by this past. Okay, actually, that's a really compelling case. I think you raise an interesting question of how you experience your own voice. And I also think you're really right to point to the mutism and the choice to be silent. I don't know if that totally translates into, I don't like my voice, so I'm sticking with my yes, because I think that she appreciates the power of it. And I also know that you don't like it much when I go back on what I said. So I found that interesting because, um, you know, you were disagreeing. It was not the first time you disagreed, but in many cases you agreed. Um, so tell me about both the sort of natural relationship that you have on the mic with each other and anything that you have learned about being intentional behind the mic with each other to make the co-hosting work well? I mean, I think the first thing that we do that actually makes this work well is we don't talk very much prior to recording an episode. We do our independent research, and then we come to the table, and we don't know what the other one has learned what's on their mind, and so that everything you hear in an episode about something we disagree on or that we talk through each other is purely happening and playing out in that moment. I think to your question about agreement, disagreement, I mean, I think that one of the things I know I admire about you and I suspect you, you know, respect in me is that we are open to different arguments, like lines of arguments. I, I appreciate a good conversation where somebody changes the way I think about an issue, a topic, or an individual. And, you know, even, even to hear that clip of how Maya Angelou felt about her voice, I know my quick reaction was, are you kidding? This is one of the great American voices of the 20th century. Of course she loved it. To hear you say, do not forget her relationship with her voice, you know, her early childhood trauma, this whole idea of mutism, I mean, that's very persuasive. That's the kind of thing that, you know, I don't know if it, it changes my answer to how I would respond in that category, but it's a good argument. And yeah, I mean, that's certainly something I look forward to and trust you to come up with. Yeah. And I, I would add to it that I think foundationally it, it is friendship, right? That's yeah. what allows us to disagree. We were friends for 10 years before we ever worked together. And I, I feel very free to to disagree with Michael. I enjoy it. Yeah. And I think he enjoys disagreeing with me. We don't do it for the sake of disagreeing. If we agree, we agree. If we disagree, we do. And sometimes it makes great tape. Sometimes it doesn't. But it's purely authentic and playing out at that time, it's two friends working something out. You wrap it up every episode with, would you have wanted this person's life? And here in this episode, Michael, you graciously cede the final word to Amit because, as you say, you have a feeling he's going to say something interesting. And now I know from our conversation that you didn't know what it was going to be, but he does. And so let's listen to this clip at the end of your episode. Amit, you are Maya Angelou. You have died and you stand before St. Peter, the Unitarian proxy for the afterlife. Make your pitch. Why should you be let in? Has anybody ever told you how important you are? 
And that really is my life's work. Through my writings, my speeches, my advocacy, I wanted everyone to know that they were important. If a word I wrote resonated, if a story from my life resonated, if a piece of wisdom resonated, it should resonate to that deep part of the body where somebody realizes that they are an individual living human being who is important. The sum of all history has led to their being alive right now, and there is nothing more important, more beautiful, more fragile, and more celebrated than that. So St. Peter, I am important. You are important. Everyone that's still down there is very, very important. Let me in. That is very, very moving. And Amit, I want to know the genesis of, you know, what turns out to be a little speech. Had you planned this? Was it spontaneous? Tell me about that. A hundred percent spontaneous. And it's it's the culmination of everything I learned in the recording leading up to that. So those words were not just what I felt. A lot of it is just what I learned from Michael and what he brought to the table. And so it's our collective output, I think, that just happens to be voiced by me. But it's 100 percent spontaneous. When we ask if we want the person's life, we do not have a prepared answer. In fact, it's our pact to not have a answer or a preconceived notion until we've concluded the conversation. In that very final segment, which you played, the pearly gates, as well, we decide at that moment, we look each other in the eye and said, who is feeling this more? And who who can deliver this and make that pitch to St. Peter? And on this particular episode, Michael said, I'm seeing it in you. And, and you take it. Take me back to the conversation where you guys went, let's not just ask the question, would you want her life. But let's actually flip the perspective here and become this person and make the pitch to St. Peter. And so you're really becoming an improv actor at that point. Take me back to that conversation. I, I just love this mechanism, this gimmick. Yeah. So the the Vanderbeek, the would you want their life, is, is what the entire buildup to the show is. And the explanation behind that is a revelation of really our own values. And that that is everything that the show is about. So we wanted the St. Peter pitch in there uh, because we believe everybody deserves a redemption and everybody deserves an angle. So this was almost a protective mechanism. What if we go through and neither of us want their life? We don't want to look as like we are criticizing this life. We're not trivializing their life. Yeah. And so we wanted everyone to have a chance at redemption. And so that's why we built that in, is that no matter what we say, if we don't want their life, that there are still reasons, there are still contributions that this person made. And now's the time to, to leave on a redemptive note, no matter what we said before. And if the first category is grading the first line of their obituary, that's some sort of proxy for an objective version of their story, as is understood by society and the history books. What we're doing, you and me, throughout the course of an episode is saying, how do I feel about their story? And and the, the very last moment is, how do they feel? Or how do we think they might feel about their own story? And that, you know, I think that there's also, in my mind, a kind of eulogizing and sending off to the Unitarian proxy for the afterlife, the heavens or whatever. Let's now say goodbye. Even though it's lighthearted and meant to be fun, this show is dealing with everybody's ultimate fate. We're all going to die, right? And what's it all mean at the end? Right. This reminded me of a session I once attended at the Neiman Narrative Conference years ago, which was a conference for radio folks and long-form feature writers. And there was a longtime journalism instructor who led a session on endings, and he said, we all pay attention to leads, but almost nothing to endings, and it's the endings that matter even more because it's what we remember. Do you agree or disagree? I think I agree. 
personally, I agree, in the sort of Maya Angelou sense of I remember how somebody made me feel. I may not remember what they did or what they said, but I remember how somebody made me feel. And I, I think that there is a value statement in the ending of our show. We all have an argument for redemption. I think that matters. I think that people can be excessively critical, self-critical. Uh, we can have a lot of judgment about ourselves. And it's important to make the case that that may not be the ultimate story. And if you've got an elevator pitch to make to St. Peter, you know, what does that sound like? Yeah. Yeah, the beginning is the hook. Like it works it works for business reasons, right? You bring people in, you attract and grow your audience, but how you leave them is what makes them coming back. I don't know if you caught it, but we end on three words. We end on let me in. And so our show begins with three words as well. It begins with this person died. So every single one of those, wherever we're at, 52, 53 episodes, starts with three words and ends with three words. And that is perfectly intentional. It's it's a metaphor for the entire show, that this person died, but there's there's a lot to still learn. Okay, let's do just two quick lightning round questions. The first question is, who is your dream guest for sound judgment? I'm very interested to see if you could ever get Michael Hobbs to uh, participate in your show. Michael Hobbs co-created You're Wrong About. He's since done Maintenance Phase. And the show that I've been really into lately is If Books Could Kill. Um, there are things about Michael Hobbs that I don't always love, but I feel like there is a, a really interesting and frankly inspiring attitude about what it means to be a host. There's a lot to learn from there. Well, that sounds really interesting. Really interesting. Amit? Uh, I think I'll go with Scott Galloway. <laughs> I thought you would. <laughs> uh, from Pivot as well as the Prof G Pod. I think he has a uncanny ability to tell stories and to speak to the future so confidently that you somehow think it's fact. And I I would love to learn that trick because it's it's great entertainment that's also informative. Great. How has hosting this show changed you? in a way that you did not expect. Oh, wow. I mean, I could go on and on about ways that this show has changed me. I think certainly it has changed my creative development process. When somebody comes to me and says, I'm really thinking about developing a show or I'd like to improve an existing show, going very deep on the what is the driving question and what is what are the creative instructions you give to yourself before you record? What about a life lesson? Oh, God. Uh, <laughs> we'll come back to you, Michael. Amit, um, let's switch to you. What is one way that hosting this show has changed you in a way that you did not expect? Uh, without a doubt, it's a loosening of rigidity. I think through our conversations, the people that we've studied, my idea of what should be, of what boundaries are, of what's possible, what's impossible, what's right and wrong has widely expanded through this. The outcome that we want the listeners to get from the show is I, I'm, I'm listener number one, I think, in really relaxing my rules of life. Almost without exception, whenever we record an episode, I learned something that I didn't know about somebody, even if I thought I knew everything. The story I tell about other people is almost always wrong. We just never know what's going on inside somebody else's head. And the only way we can begin to get at that is through empathetic imagining. This show is built on that philosophy. And I feel like it is a reminder, not just for how I feel about famous people, but what I think or don't know about what's going on with anybody I encounter in my day-to-day -day life. I do not know the whole story. That is beautiful. And it, it's very inspiring. It makes me want to go back and listen to all 52 other episodes that, that you have. Okay. So at the very beginning, I said, we're going to add a quiz question because your show is essentially a quiz show. What is the single most important skill that it requires to become a beloved 
host or to make compelling audio that listeners love? You got me at the word beloved, and I think it's vulnerability. I think it's bringing your entire self to it, being willing to air yourself, is certainly in the case of our show, um, and just not being guarded, being completely open and out there. Why? Uh, believability, relatability. If you want to be in a room with somebody, if you want to befriend somebody, if you believe them as a real person, I think you're much more likely to want to listen to them. That's beautiful. That is beautiful. Thank you. This was this was really delightful. I really enjoyed it. Thanks, Elaine. I love your show and uh, thrilled to, to be on. So thank you for inviting us. Yes. Thank you. At the end of every episode, I give you a few of the many takeaways from these conversations. Here are today's. One, Famous and Gravy has one of the strongest structural foundations for a show I've ever seen. By splitting each episode into 12 distinct categories, they have a blueprint for every episode before they start. Michael describes this structure as creative constraints, which help ignite creativity. We need those creative guardrails. Moreover, listeners know exactly what to expect, and this has big implications for the next takeaway. Two, there's a destination in every episode. Everything leads to the final question, will St. Peter let them in? Or really, would you want this dead celebrity's life? Once you know that question is coming, you'll listen to the whole episode because you have to find out the answer. Three, beginnings hook people. As Ahmed says, the beginning is the hook. It works for business reasons. You bring people in, you attract them, you grow your audience. But how you leave them at the end is what makes them keep coming back. We tend to ignore endings because they're hard. Let's pay closer attention to the end. Four, finally, packaging your episode well can mean the difference between audience stagnation and growth. It's as important as producing a great show. Amit and Michael had trouble deciding where in Apple's list of podcast categories it belonged. Was Famous and Gravy a self-help show, comedy? What do you do with a funny philosophical show about dead people? When they finally landed on entertainment and TV as their category, the marketing fell into place and growth shot up. That's all for today. If you heard anything in this episode that's helped you in your creative work, please tell us what your favorite or most useful episode has been. Send us a quick voice memo at allies at podcast allies, and we will shout you out on a future episode of Sound Judgment. You'll also be entered to win merch from your favorite podcaster who's been featured on Sound Judgment. Thanks so much for being with me this season. While we'll be off this summer, we'll still be sending our Sound Judgment newsletters full of creative advice and resources. Subscribe for free at podcastallies.com. And if you're looking for more ways to improve your own audio storytelling, we have an online course, custom workshops, speaking options for your event, and of course, our production services. You'll find information and our email address on our website and in the show notes. Sound Judgment is produced by me, Elaine Appleton Grant. Audrey Nelson helped produce this episode. Sound design by Andrew Perella. Our gorgeous cover art is by Sarah Edgel. Podcast management by Tina Basir. Happy hosting and see you soon.